Okay. Okay. Neither of our names is easy. He's a glute. I'm a McConaughey. McConaughey. I do this every year. McConaughey. Or as they say in Japan, I am Groot. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. I am Groot. We, yep, fantastic voice actor, fantastic writer, many things. You did a dinosaur encyclopedia, or is it a dictionary? Is what? You did a dinosaur book. This is Dinosaur Don. Yeah, he I've everything a lot dinosaur. of dinosaur books. He was telling me yesterday that uh, he's got a friend who's a paleontologist at the Smithsonian. Yeah, he's coming tomorrow. Awesome. And he knows Melody. What are the many, odds? Many years ago. It's a small world. Who that? Uh, my friend from the Smithsonian who's coming tomorrow. Does he have a name? Michael, Brett, Michael K. Brett Sermon. Mm -hmm. He's the world's leading authority on hadrosaurs, which are duck-billed dinosaurs. Those are the cute ones. And Don Glute is the world's leading authority on putting dinosaurs and semi-naked women together. <laughs> A talent we You know, it's funny. Uh, Michael and I have known each other for at least 20 years. We've been good friends. I've, whenever in one of my film projects or something, I need a, a male voice, I hire Michael. I don't even audition anyone else. I don't even think about it. It was at this convention that I found out he worked on the Transformers. I had no idea. I don't think we ever mentioned it. It ever came up. Well, you know, we got to keep some secrets. Yeah. And, and most recently, I, I did a movie called Tales of Frankenstein, and Michael did the opening narration, the closing narration, and narrated the trailer and the sizzle reel. So uh, That's we're all? still working together. Very cool. Anybody have any questions they want to come up and ask? They can actually be Come Transformers to me. oriented if you like. Big Transformers oriented? Thing. And no, I'm not going to get half naked because there are no dinosaurs in <laughs> Put away that Dinobot. Anybody? Come on up. Oh, here we go. Icebreaker. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. So I was wondering what was like your favorite part on working on the Transformers, like in the entirety of the cartoon and whatnot? Well, my favorite part was when the, the mail was delivered and there was a nice big check in the mail. <laughs> that was my favorite part. I think I can tell you that the checks that came in his mail were bigger than the checks that came in my mail. Oh. Uh, because the, the script writers uh, are creating something from nothing. And that's what Don was doing. Uh, they had an idea of what the characters were, and I assume uh, there was a Bible that you were... Yeah, we, we got a Bible with some uh, character descriptions, and the descriptions were pretty, you know, pretty superficial. It told you what their abilities were, what their powers were, and something vague about the personality. This character's a little shy, this character's a little bit more aggressive. And the story editors at that time were coming off of other Saturday morning shows, and didn't, when, when I got hired, I got a call from Bryce Malik, and he, um, who I knew from Hanna-Barbera, and he said, uh, I, we don't really know what this show's about. We've never done anything like this before. And uh, my fanish leanings included things like the Japanese monster movies, the Godzilla films and the Rodan films, and the um, giant robot and Ultraman television show. So that's what I had in my mind. So I tried to recreate that sort of a feel in, my, in the shows I wrote. And there's a lot of shows that, to me, I'm not, I don't need to put any other writers on, but a lot of those were written by people who didn't have that type of sensibility. So they were more like Saturday morning cartoons, you know, the, the same tropes and the same things that you see re recycled over and over again in Saturday morning shows, uh, which I tried to stay away from. So. Um, when I did shows like the, the Dinobot shows, I was really writing Mothra versus Godzilla, you know, where Mothra would swim and pull him by the tail and he'd be, you know, one of the, and he'd be trying to dig, trying to get a hold on the ground. And that's what I tried to do. The animation was pretty mediocre, I thought, so it didn't really come off the way I had envisioned it, but the thought was there. It was, it was, it was Japanese movies and television shows. That's pretty good. And in my case, it was, um, standing next to some personal gods. Because when I was a kid growing up, I watched the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and I was hearing Peter Cullen, and Frank Welker, and John Stevenson, and all those guys. So uh, when I got, a, got the audition for the thing, and got cast, and I'm in there in the same room, 
on this, in front of the same microphone, standing right next to people that I was worshiping. And inside I'm going, <laughs> it's Peter Cullen. <laughs> but outside, <clears throat> Yes, well, I'm, I'm tracked and I'm perfectly calm and in control. That's hydraulic fluid. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. And that, that was my absolute favorite moment, was arriving in the studio and seeing these people who, to me, were my childhood. And I know it's hard to believe I had one. Then again, later on, it was Cosmos who got treated like a god, and that made me feel good, too. Yeah. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, how'd, you come, how'd you come up with the voice for uh, tracks? I'm sorry, a little louder, please? Uh, how'd you come up with the voice for tracks? Mm. Well, tracks, tracks is just a little bit of a combination of Thurston Howell III, <laughs> and even before Gilligan's Island, there was a show called The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, and there was a character on there who was Chatsworth Osborne Jr., and he was the same Harvard lockjaw thing. That was sort of a standard thing, and when I got, like Don said, just a little thumbnail of what the character was, I thought, well, I know where to put this guy. So I kind of mushed those two together, and we came up with tracks, and as it appears, he's rather pleased with how he came out. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, thank you both for coming. I'm, I was so excited to see the announcement because G1 has been a huge positive influence on my life and you guys were no small part of that. So thank you, first of all. Thank you. Um, thank you. And kind of related to the first question that was asked, I wonder if you have any particularly funny stories of being in like the studio or the writer's room. Like I've heard some funny stories about like Peter Cullen making cricket noises or Chris Lotta just being insane. So I was wondering if you guys had any funny stories from your time working on the Transformers with like your coworkers and whatnot. What did you writers do? Well, we, I, I don't remember any really funny things happening, uh, except I do remember at the, at the rap party. I don't know if you, this is before you were on oh, the show. Oh, they didn't invite actors. Uh, on the, after the first season of rap party, at, when Marvel Productions was still doing the Transformers, <clears throat> there was mostly you know, the artists, the writers, and the voiceover actors. And Sid Miller was there. Sid Miller was the director of the show. and. Uh, I remembered Sid Miller from an episode, two episodes of Dragnet, the old television show. One was from the 50s version, and one was from the 60s version. He played the same character at the same time. And it was Joe Friday and his partner walking into a restaurant, and then Sid, Sid Miller was sitting there as an actor, when he was an actor, because he was also a child actor. He went back to the, bar, the East Side Kids and things like that. And Sid Miller was drunk in this character, drinking coffee. And they would question him, and he would say, he would start to answer the question, he would take a cup of, swig of coffee, and he'd go, and he would start talking, the coffee would spill out of his mouth, and he would say, yeah, dirty little Ernie, I had to go all the way to Pismo Beach to get a decent clam chowder soup. And then it would come out again, he would do this over and over and over again, and I walked up to Sid, and I said, I, said, and I called him Sid Fields, for, because Sid Fields, I always got the two Sids mixed up, Sid Fields, was an actor and a writer on the old Abbott and Costello television show. <laughs> and so, and finally he's, and I told him, I said, um, I remember you from drag then. He said, oh, you mean, you mean the Pismo Beach thing? I said, yeah, and he said, but why do you keep calling me Sid Fields? So that was the only kind of funny thing I can remember. We were cranking those things out so fast, there wasn't really time to have a lot of jokes and, you know, laughs. <laughs> But you managed. Yes, yeah, we okay. did. Especially, it's when you, you see writers, uh, other than the conferences, I, I think they've got to be like bloggers. They're sitting alone in a room doing things with equipment. Yes. Right? Uh, well, um, 
I just sat there with a typewriter in those days, in those days and a little bottle of liquid paper. This is before word processors and things. And I remember when I got, when I got my first IBM Selectric typewriter that was on that show. And um, it was like uh, state of the art because you could correct things and you didn't have to cut them out and use scotch tape and have arrows pointing different directions and everything. But those were done so fast. Um, when I wrote my first batch of them, I came with three or four of them, I got the assignment like on a Thursday and uh, I had to get three scripts in by Monday, but I was going to a paleontology con convention at Berkeley for the weekend. Hot times, man. And I had to just, on a typer, I was right, I wrote one script per day. You know, the whole thing. And those were long scripts. They were like 55, 60 pages long because when you're writing an animation script as opposed to a live action script where things are done in master scenes, you know, and the director figures out where the camera's going to go, you have to direct it on paper. Every camera shot, every cut, every close up is written into the script so you can go right to the storyboard people. And, um, so it was it was a challenge, but but we did it, you know. Super. Um, let's see. Refresh me, please. Oh. <laughs> um, any particularly interesting or funny stories oh, from your time working yes. on the transport? Oh Cullen and his cricket, of course, <laughs> because that drives the engineers insane. The studio is supposed to be quiet, and he's sitting back there doing his little cricket noise. I said, "What? Uh, wait, cut. We we we've got a got a cricket in the studio." And they go out and they look for the bug. Nothing there. They go in and start recording again. Cullen would start with a cricket. <laughs> I don't know how long it's gone until finally someone came out and said, Peter, you want to keep working? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Shut up! <laughs> but in my case, uh, the one that got me was Frank Welker. <clears throat> Uh, they, they've been doing this for so long, they have such a disturbing sense of humor, each of them. And in Wilker's case, there's always dead time when they're, the guys behind the glass, they're, they're choking each other and fighting, trying to decide how the show's going to go. And really. And Wilker would sit on a stool, be back in the corner, nothing going on, and we would hear a dime drop into a payphone. For those of you who don't know what a payphone is, <laughs> Google it. And then you'd hear the, the dial, rotary dial, Google it. <laughs> and then you would hear a phone being picked up at the other end, and Welker would start having a conversation with himself on the phone. And one by one, every head in the studio would turn to watch, and we'd wait to see how the conversation was going to flow <laughs> until he finally hung up and went, what? <laughs> Private conversation. <laughs> awesome. OK, thank you so much. That was great. You're thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, my question is, uh, for Don, is that when you were writing the Dinobots, what was your um, inspiration on how you came up on how they talked? Because they were very simple. Uh, well, again, they in the Bible, they had just basic ideas, you know, and we didn't really know. In fact, when I wrote those original Dinobot scripts, they weren't called Grimlock. I mean, I, I, you know, I made up my own names for them because we didn't have names. And I just, you know, being a paleontology guy, I named them like Tyrannobot, you know, things like that. That's what the original names were. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, you know, I just wrote them the way I thought they should talk. But the characterizations came out where people like Michael, they're the ones who brought those out. And we were, I remember being told, don't think of these characters as robots. Think of them as people with personalities. And, um, don't make them try to sound like Robbie or the Lost in Space robot or something. Don't write them that way. Write them like, like real characters, real people. Okay. Oh, Thank you. If you want some, I'm a full service voice actor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not full service, I take that back. Um, Don's right. Uh, the scripts during the course of the, uh, I, I go back to how I said, they have the hardest job because they're creating these things out of nowhere. They gave us 
they got the, the Bible and the little thumbnail description. Then in the script, they came up with the things that we as actors would work on, and with whoever was directing, we'd make little adjustments to find the character. Mm. And that would change how it was being written, and the writers would go back once the characters had been established, and it got to the point where the dialogue, after a while, was written in the style of the characters, which made it so much easier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, but without the initial basis, yeah. it became very difficult uh, for us to do the things that we wound up being able to do. So again, uh, all, all thanks to the writers, that's where it started. And, and of course, the producers and the toy makers. Thank you. You bet. Thank you guys for being here. Most welcome. Uh, this is Thank from you. Michael. Uh, Michael, you're one of few folks that have been able to uh, to be in multiple generations of, of Transformer series, and uh, you were in a part of, of course, uh, Robots in Disguise mm -hmm. 2001, a show that is criminally undervalued, uh, in my <gasps> opinion. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit about some of the differences between your work in Generation 1 and your work in Robots in Disguise uh, from, I know that the, the voice sessions were different, but uh, what, were some, what was some of your experiences like and did anyone ever say, hey, that guy was in the old one, can he tell us maybe how some of these uh, characters are supposed to act? Mm, sometimes, yes, that was the case. Uh, but incredible difference between original animation and dubbing. Original animation, there was a huge collection of different talents coming together and make the thing happen. And the animation was the last part of it. Uh, sometimes the animation would get a little um, off the track and we'd have to come back in and, and maybe fill in a little bit with some extra dialogue or something like that. With R.I.D., the, uh, the show was done, in Japanese, obviously, and then later languages all over the world. But it, uh, the dubbing approach is how to make it a little more American, while still remaining true to what the Japanese right holders wanted for the characters because they owned the show. And uh, I did write some of the scripts and directed some of the episodes and uh, got to do Hotshot and Ironhide. Ironhide, I have to tell you, Ironhide in R.I.D. sounded nothing, <laughs> nothing like Cullen's Ironhide in, in Gen 1. Why? Because by the time they brought me in for him, they had three or four other characters that wound up stealing Cullen's voice first. <laughs> <laughs> So Kaplan R.I.D. Does Ironhide, a great Colin, yeah, uh, <laughs> R.I.D. Ironhide was nothing like like Peter. Uh, Hotshot I got to do out of uh, out of whole cloth and bring him to life, and it was good to be a uh, uh, you know a young Steve stunning hero. <laughs> um, that would be nice to do again. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> um, but the the dubbing process is one actor. Not, you don't get to work with anybody else. If you're having a conversation, they're not there. So it's just one person in a booth and with the director and the engineer and another, and you're getting your directions in the headphone. Mm -hmm. And you're watching what's happening on the screen, you're reading the script, watching the time code to try and get it matched, and if you're not close enough for what the dialogue is supposed to be, then you do it again and again and again until you hit it. Uh, and notwithstanding, all the creativity that goes into original animation, dubbing is a potload harder. Mm. Um, but we wound up coming up with a pretty good product is the word we use, uh, but a really good end result and uh, got to see some incredible creativity. My, uh, my good friend, Peter Spellos mm -hmm. and his shark. <laughs> Every time that shark would blow apart, uh, you could see Peter going <laughs> It was fabulous and um, Where is he now? He's cooking and he's also doing some conventions But uh, the talent on on the dub version was really stellar There's a whole different universe of people that do dubbing and and looping than those who do original animation so uh, two entirely different experiences and I love them both and uh, the only problem 
is that I tried to direct the characters the way they were originally, which was a lot slower than the way some of the other directors did because it's something you've got to do, you know, whiz bang, pop, pow, energy, kid speed, kid speed. That's not the way he spoke. So, so, Mike, so Michael, what, yeah. you did the, when you did the voiceovers, the animation was already completed? For the, for the second series. Okay, because I but, know like Disney and some of these, you know, they would do the voices first and then do no, the animation. No, the original one, Gen 1, uh, we, we did it and then they animated to our performances. Mm -hmm. But with the dubbing, stiff, uh, they're bringing in programs, in this case from Japan, and they were well established there, so then we had to write the dialogue to fit what's going on and, and then work in the studio and make it fit even better and try and do a characterization someone wanted to hear and also please the director. Mostly it happened. Thank you very much. You bet. Uh, my question is, who came up with the crazy idea of teleporting um, all of Cybertron to Earth? That's a writer question. Yeah, that's a writer question. The, what, what was that again? The, the teleport, the, when they tried to teleport all of Cybertron to Earth. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I, which, which episode was that? I was only I. It was in you know, G1, I, I and then I was only involved it with in the, the live-action movies. So. You know, I was only involved with the show with, the, I guess, a Generation One. So I don't know what was done after that. Yeah. And I, you know, looking back at the cartoons I wrote, I don't even know what was done in Generation One because <laughs> I find it very confusing, even the ones I wrote. <laughs> okay. Would Cybertron fit on Earth? I don't know. Uh, you, uh, the, uh, oh, Cybertron was the planet, right? Yes. You know, it was funny because when I was writing those, I was always also writing GoBots and Mighty Orbots. So I was writing three giant robot shows simultaneously, <laughs> and I would get them mixed up. I would write, well, I would be writing in the middle of a GoBot script, and I'd be talking about Cybertron. You know, and, and wait a minute, wait, this is wrong. You know, and we got very hectic and very strange. I'm even more impressed. Than what? Than I was five minutes ago. Oh, and what was great about Orbots, <laughs> it wasn't, um, they weren't like animation scripts, they were like live action scripts. So we didn't have to break it down into shots and cuts and camera movements and things like that. We just wrote it as if it was going to be done with real live actors and let the director, or else maybe the storyboard people, figure it out. Yeah, little storyboard gnomes drawing pictures in the margins. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, question for each of you. Uh, Michael, uh, for Cosmos, I was just watching uh, The Secret of Omega Supreme the other day, and I had never noticed uh, for Cosmos that he has either a Latin-based or an Eastern European kind of accent to him. It, What's the inspiration there? It, it slides around a little bit. Um, <laughs> very, very loosely based on Peter Lorre. And that, by the way, was uh, the His idea of Wally Burr. a little bit like this. He has that yeah. voice right yeah. He's, well, Cosmos is, is sort of like this and, and a little bit like that. And sometimes he sort of slides into East LA. I love it. <laughs> but he shouldn't. <laughs> Peter Lorre was Hungarian. Um, and uh, apparently it's all Europe, so who cares? Uh, but the, the idea of using a voice like that came from Wally Burr. And he said, I'm looking for someone who can do a, a, a bad Peter Lorre. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, my other question is, uh, what was the relationship with Marvel Comics? I know, of course, they, you know, the comics and the show differentiated, deviated in very different, very different ways. But was there any kind of directive from them? Were they trying to get their hands in on the show? Or what was the relationship like? I don't remember ever getting, because I worked for both Marvel Comics and Marvel Productions, because I was writing the comic books. But um, all of my instructions came from uh, Bryce Malick and, and Dick, Dick Robbins. Uh, and I don't think Marvel Comics had really, I mean, we were doing them at Marvel Productions, and Stan Lee was there every day. You know, we see Stan, but um, uh, I don't think Marvel Comics had a clue what we were doing mm -hmm. until they did the, did the comic book version. They did a comic book version, right, I think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, um, and then it went over to Sunbow, and then it was pretty much taken out of our hands. Right. So Sunbow did the G.I. Joe cartoons. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yeah, there were a whole lot of companies involved. Uh, there was Marvel, Hasbro, Sunbow, some company named Claster. Never heard of Sunbow that. Claster. Yeah, I know. Oh, I saw yes. their name go by. Yeah, C L A S T E R. I don't know. Maybe it's a, like mustard plaster. Not to be confused something. with the plaster casters in case anybody's from the 60s. Don't, don't, don't go there. Oh, we won't go there. That, that's, that's rock and roll stuff. And if you're really interested, Google plaster casters. <laughs> but not when a kid's in the room. Cynthia Lindsay was a, never mind. Um, hi there. My question is for Donald. Um, I'm in a screenwriting class right now. I have 100 pages due. I currently have 11. What are your methods for writing that fast? Because it's eluding me right now. My method for writing that fast was, was like, like that, <laughs> you know? And, I, and this was the two finger method. I never hit the same, it was like when I played the piano, I never hit the same note with the same finger at the same, you know, in the same time. So um, I just write really fast. I mean, the, and writing's always been easy for me. It's, you know, like some people, acting is easy, or sports, or mathematics. With me, writing has been easy. And so I just write fast. And the, the hardest problem I had was, you know, the keys getting stuck together, because you hit them at the same time, a little bit too fast. And now with, you know, computers, it's, where you can, you can, you don't have to let mistakes get by because you're just tired of retyping that page anymore. You can go in there and fix it. But the, the drawback of that is you're always fixing. Even when you're watching the finished product, no, oh, I've only I, mm, it's done this. And um, so it's, got, it's a double-edged sword. But I'm just very fast. It's just a natural thing with me. Thank you. You could try uh, voice recognition. You can get a whole lot more words quickly. Really, truly try it. Uh, uh, and see if you can get a trial version of Dragon, naturally speaking. I found that works pretty well. Thank you. You bet. Hello. Uh, I have a question for uh, Donald about the, uh, the writing process. Uh, when dealing with a show with such a huge cast of characters, was it up to you or, or each of the writers to decide like, who well, the episodes were? Okay. Uh, the first one I did, which was Divide and Conquer, I said, well, which characters do you want me to put in this episode? Hmm. And they said, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I figured out a way. It was a battle or something with like almost cameo shots, cutting away to each one of these characters, shooting something or doing something. And then after a while, when things settled in and they got to understand more what the show was about, they would use two words, push product. Because let's face it, these were half-hour TV commercials to sell toys. <laughs> That's what they were. <laughs> And they would get a certain character that they were pushing that week or that month, or, and they would say, you emphasize this character. And then sometimes it got kind of crazy. I did one episode of G.I. Joe, and it was set on a desert, involved di cloning dinosaurs, or like in the Sahara Desert or somewhere. And they, want, they were pushing a snow skier character. <laughs> And they were adamant that I had to have this character in there somewhere. And I somehow, I don't remember how I did it, but I did it. You know, it was challenging. But um, they, yeah, they would tell you, and, and, you know, I, I like the shows where they didn't have so many characters, where you could get in a little bit of nuance here and there, and little bits of business. And, and that's why I like the two-parters, because we could get into more stuff. I did one called Dino, Dinobot Island. And there was, a, there was a, just a little bit where, um, I forgot what the, what the name of the character was, but it was a small, a, small, a small Decepticon character, I think, and it was like spying on what was going on, and a little pterodactyl came by to look, you know, what's it? and he turns around and he zaps him, and the pterodactyl flies away. Well, there was a little bit of character business that I could never have done on a half hour episode, but the two, the two parts gave me extra time where I could do something like that. Thank you. Donobot Island, PT1 and PT2. Hi there. Morning. Uh, this one's for Michael. Of the various roles that you've had, video games, cartoons, anime, and live action, what's your favorite in each? We don't have enough time. <laughs> you live long enough, the credit list grows exponentially. Um, Obviously, uh, God, I love Trax. I love Trax, and he is right out there. But Cosmos has got such a warm place in my heart because he tries so hard. <laughs> and he gets such garbage, and everyone picks on him. 
there was, and I know this is going on YouTube and that's the way it is. There was one convention we went to where we got introduced uh, with Cosmos as the most disrespected transformer in the universe. Uh, hmm. It's so sad. <laughs> Why are they always picking on me? Because you're there! <laughs> Optimus Prime! Optimus Prime! They're shooting at me! Well, get out of the way. You know what? <laughs> so in the Transformers, I love tracks, but Cosmos is my heart. In um, Vampire Hunter D, the hand, no question. Uh, oh, he was a smart ass. Can you have an ass in a hand? I don't know. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, so many other things in uh, Blizzard and World of Warcraft. I am just all over that. But I'm very sorry for killing you, by the way. <laughs> I'm you like had, a rash. I come back. Yeah, but you had an achievement, and I wanted it, so. You can try killing me. I shall only return. Rise, Paladin, for you will serve me as no one has ever served me before. Take photos. <laughs> Oh, and the other one is Frostmourne Hungers. Denny's? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You bet. Good morning to you both. Good morning. God morning. bless you for being here. Thank My you. My question is to both of you. Mm -hmm. What started and activated your imagination to enter into the transformer world? What really was the spark? That's a good word. Because <laughs> evidently the spark is still going on. What, what was the, the event or the, the motivation that really kind of got you? Well, with me, it was very simple. I got a phone call from Bryce Malik who said, that we, I'm doing a new show. You want to work on it? I said, sure. What is, what's it about? And that was it. Because in those days, you know, you wrote everything. If you're a writer, and it was a dog-eat-dog -dog business. You tried to get as much work as you could just so you could make enough to get your unemployment at the end of, you know, <laughs> at the, end of the show. And, um, uh, uh, and it just turned out with Transformers, it was something I was familiar with because of my love for the Japanese movies and things, and, and it was e they were easy for me to write. And um, it was as simple as that. But I, I just got a call and they asked me to do it, and I didn't even know that there was a show until they, I got that telephone call. In my case, um, I always knew that I was going to go to Hollywood and show off. <laughs> um, I, I knew that I was not a nice child. In school, I was I was that loudmouth kid that everyone always sees, and they you know say, "Oh, he's so cool. He's such an ass." Um, I kind of. I sort of grew out of that, I think. You'll let me know. Um, but when I finally uh, got to Hollywood, and it was, it was a kind of a long road for any actor. And by the way, I believe there's a uh, panel tomorrow on how to become a voice actor. Anyone here going to go? OK. Better get that means we'll have at least three people there, OK? <laughs> um, but. As time goes by, and I'm able to do more acting, and by the way, I'll say this tomorrow, assuming I'm at that panel, I don't know, they haven't told me yet, is the first thing to being a voice actor is to be an actor. That means doing theater. And if anyone has any idea about becoming a voice actor, learn to act first. Practice acting, because doing things with your voice, it's not doing voices and I'm not going to be on this very long. It's, it's letting a character come to life, and the character will tell you what the voice is, and the character will speak through you. So people who do voices are impressionists. Um, so I had a lot of chances to do some acting and worked up from various things until I finally got a very good agent uh, who knew at that time it was Wally Burr who was directing and said, you know, I need a couple of actors. Send me some actors. You got any actors? <laughs> um, and actually, was, I need some actors. 
do you have any actors? <laughs> Wally Burr was very presentational. And he had really clear ideas as to what he wanted. Um, and so he auditioned the actors and after the initial cast, because, I mean, who auditions Peter Cullen, aside from Michael Bay? <laughs> Oh, please, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> um, but Wally had very clear ideas and was able to bring out in all of us what it was he wanted. And I just felt like I was being brought in and enfolded into this, this godlike pantheon of, I guess it would be gods if it's godlike, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Deities, that's it. A godlike pantheon of deities. Look it up. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, let me just add one thing to it. Uh, none of you know this. I, you probably don't, Melody probably doesn't know either, but I've done voiceovers in 24 movies, oh. dubbing in Japanese anime films into English. And the way I got in was um, I had a friend who was a director who happened, and a producer who happened to get this gig with Japan to take all these old 1970s television shows, Captain Harlock and Vanguard Ace and all these things, to dub them into English and then bunch them up and make feature-length movies out of them. And so he called me, he said, Don, I like your voice, I think he can do it. And I said, okay, so I'd give it a shot. I did 24 movies, so. But I, unlike Michael, I didn't enjoy it. I, I felt, you know, I was in the little booth by myself looking at the animation. And um, I had been pretty much, I could do it, I used to do impressions, so I, I would do one character, I did one as Walter Brennan, I did one as Lon Chaney Jr., I did one as Gabby Hayes, you know, and they all worked, you know, but I just felt, I didn't like being in that little confined box, you know, and, and not seeing any other people. Uh, you, so did you, um, at Hanna-Barbera, I think, didn't they used to sit around a table or something, or uh, the, the actors all could react off each other? No, we, uh, we're lined up uh, a bunch of mics, six or eight mics in a row. Uh, we do a table read, of course, first. But that's what's, what's been what I, because I yeah. walked into a, I guess it was a table read, and all the, uh, Brock Peters and all these famous actors were sitting around a table, and, um, and that's how I thought it was going to be, but then I was in a little booth, and uh, trying to match up you know, what I saw on the screen. I had no idea what the plots were. I didn't see the scripts until I was reading the dialogue into the mic, and he said, okay, that's fine. So, you know, whatever that's worth. But what's my motivation? <laughs> Your paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> Say the words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Who, who, was, who was, you're very welcome. Who, who was this director? Uh, Bill Winkler, the Win Bill Winkler. William Winkler Productions. Ah, yep. His father was a chi famous child actor named uh, Bobby Winkler. Bill and Bobby. Hi there. Hi. Um, I was wondering, what is both of your favorite parts about this franchise? Well, in my case, it's the fact that it doesn't appear to have any end. <laughs> uh, no, I mean that in a good way, uh, because I, I, when I'm invited to a con like this and I'm able to meet the people that keep this whole phenomenon going. I see families, three generations, all wearing Transformers costumes or shirts or jewelry or whatever. And there's something about the heart of the Transformers universe, I think, that resonates with everyone. And to me, it's seeing that spirit being kept alive in families uh, that just makes me feel so proud to be a part of it. With me, it, it's pretty much what Michael just said. I just, I'm just amazed that, you know, things that that I wrote is just throwaways, you know, just to, to make the house payment or something. Uh, that people took so, you know, there were such important parts of their lives, and some of the things that I thought were really pretty awful, then somebody comes up to me and they say, oh, this changed my life. This, and I don't know how to deal with that sometimes. Or, or, I mean, because to me, it's a, you know, a great responsibility all of a sudden that it was never there to begin with. So if that makes, if that makes any sense. I'm really amazed and delighted and flattered. I mean, I'm grateful just to be here. I'm the only writer here. Um, they singled me out. I don't know why, because there are people that wrote a lot more s scripts than I did for that show. I wrote about a dozen, but Flint, Flint Dilly, and... That's your halo. Oh. Um, 
so anyway, um, we're pretty much on the same page there. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello there, gentlemen. I'm a novelist gentlemen, myself. <laughs> I'm well, a novelist myself, sir, sir. And I was wondering what your routine as far as when you sit down to write. Is there like an established method you go through? Do you have to listen to certain music, drink certain stuff to kind of get you in the mindset to write? Or do you just wake up, go straight to your writing, and that's it? Well, in my case, well, well, there was a format in television animation. You wrote a premise that you did not get paid for. You wrote a premise like, uh, you know, a, a little paragraph, just a little paragraph about what this episode is going to be about. And then if they approved the premise, they assigned you to write a treatment. And the treatment was, what well, they called it a, um, they didn't call it a treatment, it was a treatment, but they called it an outline. And you broke it down into acts and all this sort of stuff. And, and if they liked that, they paid you for that, whether they liked it or not. And then if they liked it, they would assign you to a script. And then you would write the whole script and you'd get the lion's share of the money. Um, with the Transformers, I don't think we ever did it. I don't remember ever doing an outline. It was like, you'd, get, you'd pitch a thing, you know, about three or four sentences, and Bryce would say, go ahead, we like that. And I would write the script from that. And, um, but that was unusual in TV animation. You usually had to go through all three steps. Thank you. Actually, I'm, I'm a little curious. Um, I, for both of you, very quickly, do you assign yourself hours to write? I have to. I'm also a school teacher. Uh, so. My my <laughs> writing schedule is usually, I get up in the morning, I do I feed all my animals and shave and all that stuff, and I, eat, I check all my email and Facebook messages, and yada, yada, yada. And then I start writing. And then I, I write either until I'm tired, I usually take a break in the middle of the afternoon to watch the news or something on television, and then I go back. I used to, when I was younger, I would write until 2, 3 in the morning, and I just, I got tired of that. So I usually write while it's daylight out, and uh, I don't know if that has a psychological effect on me or something, or, uh, you know, when the sun goes down, then I go out and I look for v victims to drink blood, you know. Um, Leave the blood drinking to the hand. Pardon me? What was that? Leave it to, Leave the, it to the hand. Oh, higher hunter D. Good afternoon. Um, Morning. Mr. Glut. Uh, glute. Glute, Glute, sorry. Um, what was your favorite and least favorite episodes that you wrote? Uh, my favorite, I only have three that I really liked. One was uh, Dinobot Island because I got to do more, because it was two parts. One was Megatron's Master Plan, which was my version of uh, Me John Doe. And then uh, Autobot Spike, which got really panned on a review on the internet I found the other day. The guy really snarky, you know, guy sitting behind his computer, you know. Someone you know. snarky He's on the snarky, internet? Snarky, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, I, the least one I think was probably Autobot Run. I didn't think that was too good. Uh, the other ones all kind of run together, I thought. But I really like those three. Thank you. Oh, and one more thing. Um, when I was a kid, back in Blockbuster, I used to rent Divide and Conquer all the time. Oh, well, that was my first one. Uh, so that was, a, um, uh, somebody else told me that was their favorite. And I, and I was amazed at that, because we really didn't have a feel for the show yet at that point, you know. It was <laughs> one of the very first ones. and. Um, uh, you know, I didn't know if they were going to like it, but I, I got more of a feel for it as we went along and got to know the characters more and how they interacted and that sort of thing. Thank well, you. that's just how good you are. Well, you know, it's either that or get a job somewhere. Yeah, it was like one of the first Transformers episodes that I saw all the way through, like when I was really little. Uh. You know, back when video rentals were a thing. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I don't mind people saying, you know, I, I, as a kid, I, I, you don't know what you meant to me as uh, growing up, unless the person telling me has got a gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Hi guys, how are you? Um, two, two questions. Uh, first being, having worked on the franchise for as long as you have, um, at this stage in your careers, do you find yourselves actually being fans? Um, and then the second part is, um, with the mixed feelings of the Bayverse films and the, the, the recent um, uh, Travis Knight Bumblebee film, uh, what would you guys like to see from the franchise and the filmverse? 
I would like to see the film version end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and the first question, I didn't get the last part of that. What was the first question? So having worked on the, in the franchise for so long, at this stage in, in your careers, do you find yourself to actually be a fan of the franchise? No, I never was a fan. You know, so many of the things that I've written over the years, that people seem to assume I was a fan of, like Star Wars and, you know, I was never a fan of these things. I was, I did, it was a job. I did it, I sat down, I did it, you know, like doing any, like writing a Porky Pig comic book or something, you know, mm -hmm. it was it was just all the same. And, um, and my association with Transformers was only in generation one, that was it. Mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with the movies, the animation movies, the live action movies, or. Uh, the comic books or the toys or anything like that. So, um, and most of what I did, I don't really remember because it just got lumped in with a lot of other stuff I did, you know, and they kind of run together. It was like when I was writing one script and putting the character from the other to show and it went by mistake. So, um, uh, you know, what they did after I left it, I don't really even know what they did, mm. you know. Fair enough. In my case, um, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a fan of the franchise. There are some actors that go back and watch what they do mm -hmm. endlessly, over and over again, saying, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> um, when I do a job, I have a feeling for it when I'm doing it, and I've, I have a feeling as to how it was done when it's over, mm -hmm. but I don't generally go back and see it again. So whatever I did lives up here. Uh, in that regard, and what I said earlier, the spirit of the franchise, mm -hmm. which I feel is much more embodied in the animation and in the hearts of you people who keep this alive is the incredible humanity and the moral authority of basically living a good life and helping other people and doing what is right. And in a spiritual sense, that is what I hold on to. That's what I like. That's what I take away from the franchise. Um, I will say nothing about the films. Except that Bumblebee is not a muscle car. That's all. Right. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Thank you guys. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, okay. Is this thing on? Mostly. Okay. Um, a few questions. I mean, mainly three, I think. Is that as high as you'll go? Say again? Is three questions high as y'all go? But whatever. We'll okay. cut you off when you do. Three's okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Anyways, um, uh, to, what was your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on the Japanese show Headmasters? Uh, I never heard of it, so I don't know. What's that? Uh, I'm, okay. I'm not sure, actually at this point, I'm not sure if I was involved with Headmasters or not. I don't think so. Okay. Understood. In which case, I don't have any opinion. Okay. Anyways, uh, to Michael, what's your favorite anime role of all time? Name three. Oh, Lordy. All right, favorite anime role. Um, I will tell you my very top favorite is from a series called Gungrave. Oh. And it is the character of Big Daddy who was basically a crime boss with a beautiful daughter who fell in love with a rake hell hero who I didn't like. Um, actually, she wasn't my daughter, I lie. <laughs> I loved her. And the whole story is this established elder gentleman who's very human role where I didn't do any big, huge, evil guy. It wasn't monstrous. He wasn't wildly character. It was just an older man who was slowly breaking his heart over this beautiful woman who was never going to be his. Huh. And I just loved that role. Um, other stuff, obviously, the Vampire Hunter D, Captain Harlock, the earlier stuff. Um, Robotech, Rolf Emerson. I got blown up pretty good. That was good. I see. Um, Schwarzwald from the Big O. I really like that man. 
He was crazier than a bag full of honeybees, but he was right. They just wouldn't listen. Um, and gosh, uh, for a third one, I don't know, they, at this point, there really are a lot of them. So let's go with those two, Schwarzwald okay. and Big Daddy. Okay, I also prefer your role in Bubba as the narrator. Uh, that was that one was my childhood favorite. The uh, uh, the producer would come in and tell us how to say the name. It's uh, a, a Korean guy. Says, no, no, it's not bo bo bo. It's bo 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 bo. Bo 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 bo. No, 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 no. Bo 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 bo. And you have to have to flap the cheeks when you said it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that, the narrator on that was nuts. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Okay, anyways, let's see. Let's, uh, oh, yes. Uh, in the Generation War cartoon, is there anything that you would like to go back and write on? Me? Yes. Um, if there were a check involved. Uh, if there were still Saturday morning or... Mm. I don't know. I, I would like to write on any of them because, you know, they paid well. You know, okay. I mean, that's, that's the reason I wrote those cartoons, all those cartoons. Um, you know, it, it, tough to get on to any cartoon show because everybody wanted to do it and everybody was fighting for the job. So you got as many as you could get. So I wrote on shows that I didn't particularly care about or like, like the Manchichis and, uh, you know, it's, it's strange. I was, a couple that I really liked on uh, DuckTales and RoboCop, you know, but most of them were just you know, cranked out according to formulas. And if you deviated from those formulas in any way, or if you ever heard the story editor say, hey, I really like this, this is really unusual, this is great, you know you're not gonna get the next job because it deviated from that formula. Hey, hey, we're on Chi Chi, and people say we Chi Chi around. And I worked for them, too. Oh, different, don't fight. <laughs> you wrote for Mickey Braddock, I mean Dolan's? No, but Mike Nesmith was the producer of my band. Ooh. Ah, back in the back in the day, but nobody we, here knows who the monkeys are anyway. So hey, I do. You're all too young. I mean, too old. Yeah. If you know who Mike Nesmith is, and you can find it somewhere, there's a series called Television Parts. Oh, that's great. There's also a, a, a special. I think it was a directed video thing called Elephant Parts. Insanely funny stuff. And I'm sorry to hold you up. There's one point. I believe it's in Television <laughs> Parts when Nesmith. Uh, you know, he's wearing his little beanie from the monkeys, he's got a guitar, and he's got a dinosaur suit from the waist down. And he's singing, Her name was Rodan, and she lived in the ocean off Japan. That really sounded like Mike. Yeah, that's a good imitation. That was great. <laughs> I got puberty now, Yeah, Mike sorry. Nesmith um, pretty much created the music video. Yeah, in, in, incredibly brilliant stuff. Okay. Sorry. We have question. time for one more question. One more question. Uh, actually, depends on, sir. Okay, I lost him. No, he's back okay. there. Okay, he, he's going. Okay. Where are you from, buddy? We probably have time for your question. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. All right, we're gonna make this as quick as possible. Yes. I'll shut up. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. So, one my mind, bring back up here. Um, did either of you expect G1 to take off as far as it has and give the franchise such strong legs to continue as it? as it has into the future. I mean, it's been 30 years, so. I, I couldn't hear what you said. I didn't Sorry. expect it to have the kind of legs it has. Did either of you G1. expect G1 to take off as far as it has and give the franchise such strong legs to continue so far into the future? No, I, I had no idea. It was uh, a, lot, a lot of things I was involved with. I had no idea that they were gonna have this kind of lasting value. It was just, it was just amazing to me. And it ties into what I said before. It, uh, I didn't expect to have a cartoon series, a cartoon show, have the kind of heart that would give it this lasting impression uh, that people embraced and held. And I'm very grateful to be a part of it. Uh, back when you, when you, you know, you were a writer for a G1 show. Were, was there any particular progress or process that you went through when you like made a made, uh, when you were writing for it, like, or was it just something like you were just sitting down one day, thought, hey, that'd be a cool idea, and then Yeah, just it was, you know, it was, it was just, you get an idea of, I mean, like, the way I write these comic book strips, stories now for the Creeps magazine, I, I, I think of a title, I'll be watching something on the news, or, you know, like, um, 
Um, you know, I remember when, when Hillary Clinton called all the Republicans a, a basket of uh, deplorables. And, hey, what a great idea for a story, a casket of deplorables. And I wrote a script around that. But before I wrote the script, I thought of an ending. What kind of a surprise ending can I write that'll tie in with that title and have the host character come up with some puns? Well, what are the puns going to be? And then I write the story. I sit down. Page one, the story's got to be six pages, and I start typing, and by page six, I'm at the end. I mean, it just, it's just like a natural thing with me. Those adorable deplorables. I, I like the idea. I just want one called uh, Dismember the Alamo. That's a good one. Um, do you believe that your Transformers character, Cosmos, deserves some love? <laughs> yes. Cosmos uh. deserves love. Cosmos deserves to be worshipped. Wait, he was! Um, no, I, uh, as I said before, he's, uh, he has a special place in my heart, and I think he absolutely deserves to be loved and told over and over again because he has issues regarding his value to the universe. So love Cosmos, please, and let him know. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Great panel. Hey, this is Alex Malari Jr. and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. Your emperor commands it. Thanks for watching.